what causes Muslims themselves to leave faith or to not feel solidified enough in faith to meaningfully absorb it and practice it as well as contribute through its lens. And doubt in this sense is internal conflict, right, with the faith. How many of you know someone who has left Islam? If I was to ask that question at an Islamic convention 10 years ago, it would not have been even 50% of those hands, right? That people that we actually know that have actively left their faith. How many of you know someone that is struggling with the faith, including, it could include yourself. How many of you know someone struggling with the faith? Vulnerability. So when you look at the Pew studies and you see 23% of American-born Muslims no, no longer even identify with Islam, that tells you something. But the statistics could be very telling. Why is it that 80% of American Muslims fast, but only 39% pray, when prayer is more important than fasting in the hierarchy of the pillars of Islam? What does that say about identity and belonging and, and different factors that come into play with our worship? Most people did not identify intellectual reasons for their departure from Islam, but deeply personal ones. Because you cannot separate your personal experiences from your belief, from the way that you would view God and from the way that you would view the world around you. We are complex beings, but everything is deeply interconnected. If the authority in your life has been abusive, then naturally when God is introduced into your life as an authority, you're going to view him probably through an abusive lens because that's what it was. If it was highly disciplinary, God's, you know, there, there are triggers and anything that's disciplinary associated with God in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu if culture was presented to you packaged as religion and you had an aversion to that cultural idea, thinking that it was Islam that might have turned you off of the religion. If you've been constantly bombarded with this idea that you are from a backwards way of thinking, an inferior religion, an inferior way of life, and you went to public school your entire life and everyone around you you know, felt sorry for you, or pitied you, and viewed you as being oppressed, and you naturally started to view yourself as oppressed. All of those things are deeply interconnected. So there is an intellectual component, because what those things do at the personal level is they expose our intellectual deficiencies as well, and our spiritual deficiencies as well. But at the same time, dealing with the personal, and what that particular personal impact is on my faith, which is at the bare minimum, from an Islamic perspective, the definition of my life's purpose and what the personal means with that. There is a way to spiritually anchor yourself in a way that Islam and faith would be rooted in your heart so that when the intellectual and the personal come, they cause your tree to bend but not break because you're, it's, it's deeply anchored in the heart. There's a spiritual anchor in the heart. There's that, that relationship you have with Allah, that knowledge of the person of the Prophet ﷺ, which personally I think one of the greatest ways to solidify faith in your heart is learning about the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, the person of the Messenger ﷺ. That all of that that is based in the heart and that belief in Allah and knowing Allah and who Allah is and connecting all of the questions that you have to the attributes of Allah that render primary concerns about Islam to secondary concerns about Islam. But how do you then deal with the person? Now here's one wrong way to approach this. The wrong way to approach this would be to suggest that there is no value whatsoever in counseling, in therapy, that there are no concepts of depression, just read Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak and everything will just go away. Or, you know, all that, that all of these deeply traumatic things that have taken place have a, uh, you know, just a scripture that needs to be recited and then it's all going to go away. Spiritual bypass, bypass the entire, you know, the entire corpus of advancement that we've made in how we personally take care of ourselves, how we internalize the experiences around us in a way that's healthy, not just spiritually healthy, but emotionally healthy, that allows us to not, you know, to, to make progress in our lives, whether that purpose is worldly in its nature or it's towards the hereafter. But how do you, you know, deal with everything that's taking place? So the suggestion can't be that the solution to depression is just re and bypass it all. And the solution also cannot be to equate depression with low faith. That connection does not exist in the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That's an interpretation that I think is very faulty, but it does not exist in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. However, it is very useful to understand the connections between what happens to me on a personal level 
and what that means in terms of my faith and how I can make sense of that in a way that's productive and in a way that allows me to take the first steps towards not just rectifying that chaos in regards to my faith, but that, that chaos in regards to life as a whole and, and how I start to put that back together. On the relationship between trauma and faith and the relationship between our personal and everything that happens to us at an experiential level because Islam is a lived faith. It's a lived experience. It's not just sorting out creedal concepts. It's a lived experience. It is supposed to touch every element of your life. So I need to better understand how that connection plays out in a healthy way in my life. And I want to leave you with this one point, inshallah ta'ala. A lot of people think, it's not just equating low iman and depression, which is the problem. A lot of people think that if I do something like counseling or start to try to put these pieces together, that that is because I failed to do it all myself with just what the Quran and the Sunnah gave me. By trying to get help, by trying to understand these things, it means that I couldn't put it together myself. Yeah, it was easy to recommend it to someone else when I saw them in a bad situation and say, hey, look, maybe you should get counseling or maybe you should do this or maybe that. But for me, myself, I'm going to be strong and do it all through the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and I'm just going to understand it myself and put it all together myself. We are made up of so many different components as people. And if any of you have ever taken a Tazkiyah class with me, you would have heard this statement. You cannot be disciplined in anything unless you're disciplined in everything. You cannot be disciplined in anything unless you're disciplined in everything. Eventually, the areas of your life that are not put together are going to bleed into the other areas. And they're going to have real impacts on those other areas of life. So I can't leave one area of my life in shambles and run to the area of my life that makes me feel better and just focus on that. And I come back to a statement from Abu Hazm rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the tabi'een who was asked by Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik rahimahullah, who was the Khalifa, he said, why do we hate death so much? Why do we hate death as people? Why does death cause us the apprehension that it causes us? And he responded, he says, because you have established yourself in life and you have ruined your hereafter. So you naturally, a person hates to leave an area that they feel well established in to an area of uncertainty in a place that's in shambles. If you apply that methodology to the things that take place in our lives, then you'll also find it to be true. A lot of times if things are not put together in one area of life, I'm not going to try to fix that. I'm just going to continue to, to indulge disproportionately the area that makes me feel good about myself. The area where I feel fulfilled and hope that I can continue to bleed into that and just focus on that. But that's not sustainable and it's not healthy and it's not Islamic. Islamically speaking, whatever you do for yourself to make yourself a more capable abd of Allah, a more capable slave of Allah, and a more capable khadim, a more capable servant to the people, is rewardable in and of itself. So all those notions of self-care and emotional health and taking a break, inshallah ta'ala, um, make things better for us in that regard. I will just continue um, on, this, on this note and I'll just end with something which I think is very important about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and who he is and what we can take as a lesson from him. You know, you look at the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you always see this perfect balance that he had in his life. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was who he was inside the house, outside the house. His excellence in worship was represented in his excellence in his work ethic. His being a community leader was also tied to his being you know, a, a, a good father, a good husband, someone that was considerate. So those qualities that you see that led to the excellence of the Prophet ﷺ in those different uh, areas of his life were not circumstantial. So the quality of empathy, for example, was something that impacted the Prophet ﷺ's dua and impacted the Prophet ﷺ how he dealt with his family and impacted the Prophet ﷺ and how he dealt with his community. That quality of seeing things through, uh, the perfection of an action, making sure that an action is done right, was something that manifested itself in every aspect of life of the Prophet ﷺ with the way that he did his wudu to you know, the, the very famous, um, a beautiful hadith, one that really moved me from Abdullah ibn Abi Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said that, describing the Prophet ﷺ in Shema al-Muhammadiyah, he said that, the Prophet ﷺ was not too proud. He was not too proud to be seen constantly walking with an orphan or with someone who was poor or a widow. Until the Prophet ﷺ made sure that they saw the end of what they were seeking. So he wouldn't just touch something, he would see it 
it's through, right? So it's a quality that the Prophet ﷺ developed that he could take intentionally to every single aspect of his life. And so when we're talking about adopting these qualities of the Prophet ﷺ in our different aspects of life, it's to help put us together in the most wholesome way possible in a way that benefits our deen and our dunya, a way that benefits our careers and our family lives, in a way that benefits our productive role as community servants as well as uh, not being sloppy with our acts of worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's to develop those frameworks, those qualities and that balance. And on that note, inshaAllah ta'ala, you cannot expect religion to be put together for you if you don't give it its time. Anything in life, you've got to give it its time. So you've got to be attentive to it. If you want it to come together in a way that's healthy, you have to be willing to give it its time. So if you want things, if, if you're in a, in a, in a turbulent marriage, you need to be willing to give it time to reduce that turbulence, right? And you have to be willing to take the necessary steps. The same thing with faith. This isn't something that just comes to you when it's in shambles, like I'm just going to make dua and why isn't it happening for me? Giving it its time and taking the necessary steps to put it together. And if this is our priority, to have our purpose in line, to have our faith in line, then we have to be willing to be extremely intentional about doing whatever it is that's necessary to keep it put together and streamlined with Allah Ta'ala. We need your support more than ever. Your support can help us continue to educate and motivate people to make and publish videos daily. Jazakallah.